I'm Meg Lambert. I'm a neuroscience nurse, and I have been in the world of DBS for the last 12 years. Uh, until recently, I was the DBS program coordinator at Barrow Neurological Institute, working with Dr. Francisco Ponce, who is the neurosurgeon who performs the DBS surgery. That's where Dr. Evidente refers his patients to. And like I was telling you earlier, before we got started, I personally have been involved in 1,200 DBS surgeries over the years. Um, Dr. Ponce is the number one implanter in the United States. So he does quite a few patients and I've had the, the opportunity and the pleasure of being the nurse in the program. So I have a wealth of knowledge. So please feel free to ask, ask any questions you may have. So the purpose of today's presentation is I'm going to go over deep brain stimulation surgery. I'm gonna explain who is a good candidate for the surgery because not everybody is. Um, how the surgery is performed, and what to expect postoperatively. Now, there's three devices on the market. I currently work for Medtronic Corporation. Um, they are one of the device makers. They've been the one who is leading DBS. They've been around since the uh, early 90s in DBS. Uh, I currently work for them. Uh, but today, I'm only going to talk about DBS, like I described, after I speak. A representative from my company, Medtronic, a representative from Boston Scientific, and a representative from Abbott will be here to talk to you about their particular devices. So you and you, you and Dr. Evidente can make an informed decision on which way you want to go. So let's get started. So what's DBS? DBS is a surgical treatment that helps control some of the motor symptoms of certain movement disorders, Parkinson's essential tremor and dystonia. Electrical stimulation is applied to certain areas of the brain or what we call nuclei that we know house those circuits that send the messages for movement. By applying this electrical stimulation, we help to control those symptoms that you have from your movement disorder. DBS is not a cure, nor is it a treatment of last resort. It works in combination with medication and with physical therapy, occupational therapy. However, if you're under the care of Dr. Evidente, he's one of the leading experts in the United States on how to adjust and remove many, many medications from your regimen once you've had DBS. So how does it work? This little video I want you to watch, this video will show you where the device is implanted in the body. That's the purpose of this. All right. DBS therapy uses a medical device, much like a cardiac pacemaker, and thin, soft, flexible wires called leads That's okay. All the time. For some reason. Does not like to share, so. been doing this for quite a while. Yes, sir. Is it always affected? Mostly affected? If you see the key, there's three things. You'll, uh, I'm jumping. Good patient selection, a good neurosurgeon that knows how to put those leads exactly where they need to go, and good programming of the device. So those are the three keys. Selection plays into am I a proper candidate? Correct, because it's not for everybody. As are the drugs. I've tried several, no result. Mm -hmm. As are the list of others. Oh, I forgot to ask, what is your diagnosis? Essential trauma. And what do you, Parkinson's? Yeah. My dad had Parkinson's. Yeah. Is it hereditary? You know, the the there are some opinions that parkinson's could be hereditary you could have the proclivity or the the genetic predisposition just like anything else but you have to have an environmental dbs there an environmental um impact and they have to be together for example my dad people ask me all the time are you going to get tested are you going to get tested why am i going to get tested my dad 
clearly had the predisposition, but he drank well water as a child in Passaic, New Jersey, and the county over had all these manufacturing before they had the EPA and everything leached in there. Secondly, he was a metallurgist during World War II, exposed to heavy metals. So a lot of farmers get Parkinson's because they're exposed to um, uh, fertilizers and all those kind of things. So they say there, there's usually an environmental factor plus the predisposition, but I'm not well versed on that. That's just a general overview. And with the central tremor, nobody knows why you get that. We know it's familial. Yeah, there's a, there's something in the brain, in the cerebellum, there's just a, a little wire that's tweaked somehow. I do. Oh, wait, I have to get my bag. Much like a cardiac pacemaker and thin, soft, flexible wires called beads, completely inside the body while the device is in place. Okay, let's start it from the beginning then. Somebody that knows how to program the device properly and manage medications. Yep. DBS therapy uses a medical device, much like a cardiac pacemaker, and thin, soft, flexible wires called leads completely inside the body. While the device is implanted beneath the skin in the chest, the leads are implanted within the brain. Electrical stimulation is then sent directly to targeted areas within the brain. Stimulation of these areas enables the brain circuits that control movement to function better. This results in a reduction of some symptoms in many patients. So I'm going to go back. Oh, wait. And I just want to fast forward because I want you to see where it's actually DB keep going. DBS keep therapy going. uses a medical device, much like a cardiac pacemaker, <sighs> and thin, soft, flexible wires called leads completely inside the body. While the device is implanted beneath the skin in the chest, the leads are implanted within the brain. Electrical stimulation is then sent directly to targeted areas within the brain. Stimulation of these areas enables the brain circuits that control movement to function better. Okay, I just want you to see in this particular patient, this patient has two leads into the brain and then it's connected to a connector that goes under the skin of the neck to the ch under the skin of the chest to the neurostimulator that's placed in the chest. So I just wanted you to see this, where the device is implanted in the brain. It could, if you, if you got a big one and you were small, now your body habitus is normal. Mine is normal, sort of. But if you were a skinny little girl that was 100 pounds, it might be more obvious. No. The question was, how do you put that connector in? And I'll get to that. But no, we do not cut your skin and your scalp and your skin in your, your neck. No, that's not how it's done. But I'll get to that. All right. I'm going to give you a little brief history of deep brain stimulation. Back in the day, the only surgery that was available for movement disorders and only for tremor control was a surgery called a thalamotomy or a pallidotomy. So the patient would be awake, they would do a little burr hole, put a wire in to a certain location in the brain, give it a little electrical stimulation, watch the tremor stop, and they go, okay, zap, and they burn the brain tissue. It was permanent, but if you had profound tremor and there was nothing that could be done with medicine, people would sign up for this particular procedure. Well, there was a doctor in France who did quite a few of these thalamotomy pallidotomies. And one day a light bulb went on in his head. He goes, wait a minute, why are we burning viable brain tissue that will not regenerate when we know if we apply a little electrical stimulation to the brain, we can stop the tremor. It was the same time they were actually working on cardiac pacemakers. So he took the same technology and applied it to the brain and voila, DBS was created. 
So 1987, he did his first case in France. It moved across the pond to the United States in the early 90s. They did the FDA trials. Barrow, where I used to work, was one of those FDA locations where they were trialing this to see if it was safe and effective. And in 1997, the FDA approved DBS for essential tremor in 2002 for Parkinson's disease and for 2003 for dystonia. So my point here is this has been around FDA approved in the United States for 25 years. So this is not new and it is not experimental. And trust me, I've dealt with the FDA. They are very difficult to get anything approved because the first thing the FDA looks at is safety. The second thing is effectiveness. So that's how they work. Anyway, the DBS system, I describe it as modular furniture. There's three distinct parts. They all hook together, but the beauty of the system is if one part needs to be replaced, you don't have to take everything out. So the first part of the system is the lead or electrode. It's a thin wire, like you saw in the video, that goes down into, deep into the brain. There we go. Goes about four inches down on an angle into the location in the brain where we know those little nuclei live that have the circuits for movement. So here is a lead, here's an electrode right here. It's thin little wire. We're not allowed to pass it around. And see the tip? The tip, those four little metal bands there, those are called contacts. So it goes down, remember I said I have my brain? I always carry my brain with me. Oh wait, there's more, I have a brain cup. And every time I drink from this cup, I get a little smarter. <laughs> Would you like some water? There's water here, okay. Um, so you can see this lead goes down about four inches on an angle into the brain in the area where we know those little nuclei live. And again, on the tip, you're gonna see what's called contacts, little metal bands, there could be four, there could be eight, um, and that's where we send the stimulation to, one or more of these contacts. So you're gonna hear that word a lot in your DBS journey. What contact do we use? We're on contact three, we're on contact four, that kind of thing. Correct. You must be an engineer. So the next part of this system is the connector. That's what we were talking about earlier, the connector. It's another plastic-like wire. It's coated with a soft plastic, and it goes and connects with the tail of the lead. Here, I want to show you this again. This is where we place the, 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 the lead, like this. Now this is the excess. I call this the tail. And what we do is we put it under the skin of the scalp. And then you free it up and connect it to the connector. And with a very special instrument, the doctor will make a little incision back here above the ear. Free up the tail or tails of those electrodes or leads, connect it to the connectors, and with a very special instrument, we glide it down under the skin. You have a lot of play under there. Special instrument, it glides it down under the skin to the chest, and then they make a little incision here to connect it to the battery. So the connector, and you can't see it unless you are very thin, and you turn your neck very tightly like this, you might see a little outline. But otherwise, you don't see it, you don't feel it. So the device pushes its way from the sensor down through your skin so the connector the, the connector does it goes down under the skin no muscle is cut it's just under the skin the only part of the system that ever needs replacing is the battery here in the chest the connector and the leads stay fixed Unless, unfortunately, a patient gets an infection, then everything comes out when we start from scratch. That's, a, that's like 0.1% chance of that happening. So it's the battery 
And the battery, depending on which one, and we're jumping again, depends on which battery is implanted, how long it's going to last, and when you have to replace it. And I'll get to that. I'll get to that. There's two kinds of batteries. So here's the battery. This is the third part of the system. It's called the neurostimulator, the internal pulse generator. We just call it the battery around here for simplicity's sake. This, this is the brains of the operation. We tell it how much stimulation to send to your brain and where to send it, one or two of those contacts. So we program it, Dr. Evidente and his nurse Maris, they will program this and tell it what to send to your brain. So this is the brains of the operation. It's like a little computer in your chest. And those are the three devices that are out there. You can see they're nice and rounded. There's no edges, yeah? <laughs> anyway, we're, here's your, the answer to your question. Types of batteries. There's two types of batteries available to you depending on the manufacturer. The first type of battery is called a non-rechargeable battery. I call it the set it and forget it crock pop model. You put it in, you go about your business, it wears down, the life expectancy is usually between three and five years, and there's a way you can check it at home, and Dr. Evidente checks it every time you come in to see the battery life, much like your car battery, you get a little notice. Or you can tell when you're putting the car on, something's not right. But with this one, we have a way for you to check it at home to see how it's depleting. And when it gets to the point where it's time to schedule your battery change, you come in, it literally takes Dr. Ponce 12 minutes to change a battery, faster than your car. You come in, you get a little bit of anesthesia just for comfort. They open up the incision on your chest, pop the battery out, connect a new one in there, put it back in, tack it in place, close it, boom, you go home that day. He uses, he sometimes uses glue and dissolvable sutures and sometimes he uses staples. It depends. So that's it. It's very simple to do. So those batteries last three to five years. The other type of battery that's available is called a rechargeable battery. Rechargeable battery, and the reps are gonna show them to you, they're smaller and thinner than a non-rechargeable battery. But what you have to do, and they last 15 years, what you have to do is you have to charge it at home on a regular basis, like once a week or so. Some people top it off every day. Some people do it two or three times a week. Some people do it once a week. It's a very simple thing to do. There's a, almost like a sleeve that goes around your neck with two little pockets. You put your recharger in one pocket. Then you have another recharging tool here. You press the button and you sit and read a book or watch a TV show and then it beeps when it's done. It's that simple. It depends. If you do it once a week, it could be 30 minutes or more. If you do it every day, it could be a couple of minutes. It's up to you. I always tell them. One of the parts of it is extra. The recharging unit. It just goes onto your skin. That's it. So how yeah. Is it yeah. Radio or yeah. Yeah. So um, it's very easy to do. Uh, but it's your choice, you know. Some people, they want the rechargeable because they don't want to go through a couple of surgeries over the years. Some people say, I just want to set it and forget it. I don't want to worry about doing that. But I'm telling you, if you choose the recharger, think about something you do on a daily basis. Like me, I watch the news every morning. So I'll sit in bed. I'd probably charge it up. Incorporate it into something you do on a daily basis. Do you have a favorite show? Like my mom watches Jeopardy every night. Sit in your comfy chair, put your recharger on, boom, watch Jeopardy, you're done. So something like that. So I always tell patients, just incorporate the recharging. So the reps are going to get into detail about this, but I just want to let you know there's two types, non-rechargeable, three to five years, rechargeable, 15 years. What happens if you go to my bell? Are you rechargeable and you forget your bell? It stops working and all your symptoms come back. So that's another thing. If you do have the rechargeable battery, you have to remember when you go out of town, whatever, there's a nice little bag it comes in. You just take that with you. And let me tell you, never put that in your suitcase and check your suitcase. What if it gets lost? Very expensive piece of equipment. Always take it on the plane with you as a carry-on. And do you know if you bring a piece of medical equipment on a plane, 
it cannot be counted as a carry-on. It's the law. A lot of people aren't aware of that. Trust me, I had an asthmatic child and I carried that little machine with me every time we traveled. You can't count a medical piece of equipment as a carry-on. So always carry it on with you. All right. No, no. Uh-uh. It's little. Exactly. So anyway, battery placement. Where are we going to put that battery? The majority of people have it put in their chest on the left side. Reason being, if you're right-handed, we usually do it on the opposite side of the chest. If you're left-handed, we'll do it on the right side. It's up to you. However, if you have a cardiac pacemaker, an implantable defibrillator, or perhaps you have had breast cancer or lung cancer on one side or the other, we'll always do it on the opposite side. What if you need treatment in the future? God forbid. So if you have a pacemaker, we're going to put it over here. That's it. The other place we can put it is in your belly. Now, why would we do that? Some people don't want to have scars on their chest. Seriously, seriously. So they take an extra long connector and they bring it down under the skin and they implant it right here in the belly. And it's fine. However, I'll caution you if you choose that route, when getting up from a chair right after surgery is a little painful, like having, you know, uh, sneezing. But it goes away and it settles in nicely and people forget they're there. But it's a choice you have. The other thing to remember here in Arizona, we like to shoot guns. So if you shoot a rifle or an AK or something like that, we always put your battery on the opposite side of where your gun stock lies because of the recoil. Just keep that in mind. It's not going to affect your golf swing. It's not going to affect your tennis. It's not going to affect your ability to cast a fishing pole. So just shooting is something that we can see. No? It's right here. Doesn't bother you. However, I'll tell you, sometimes after surgery, let's say you put the battery in the left side of your chest and you're driving eventually. You put your belt over. If it rubs, it might be a little uncomfortable. So what I tell patients is, you know those seatbelt, those sleeves you can get with the they're cushioned? Just get one of those for a little while until it settles in. So again, Regarding the placement, it's your lifestyle, your body habitus, and your hobbies that we take into account. Body habit, like I talked about, a little tiny lady versus somebody like me. All right, types of devices, like I said, there's three that are FDA approved on the market, Medtronic, who I work for, Abbott, and Boston Scientific. They all function in the same way by delivering stimulation to certain targets in the brain, but each device has their special features and the reps are going to go over those with you right after me and please discuss choices you know what you learned today discuss with dr evidente he will help guide you on your choice question occurs to me um, my tremor is very annoying but it's not disabling this sounds like it's for a more severe case of when this progresses no if you're, in your opinion, your tremor is affecting your quality of life, doesn't have to be disabling. Here's an example. I have a patient. She was um, a blogger and a potter. She lived in New Mexico. She actually came to see Dr. Evidente from New Mexico. She went to another, another program who looked at her fine tremor and said, nah, your tremor's not bad. Nobody asked her what she did. She was a potter. She could no longer do her pottery, and that was her livelihood. And she also blogged about it in some art community. She couldn't do those things. We had another woman, same thing. Oh, no, your tremor's too fine. We're not going to do surgery. She came to see Dr. Evidente, and he said to her, what do you do for a living? She said, I set jewelry. Well, come on now. So it's quality of life. It's not the severity of the tremor. It's how it's affecting your personal quality of life. It's just like a sliding scale. My typing is getting worse. I can still type. Yeah, but it's, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, okay. so let's talk about Parkinson's disease. Like I said, you can't show up in the office. Hello, I'm here. I want brain surgery. It doesn't happen that way. So. This is what we look for. This is FDA guidelines. A diagnosis of four years or more. Responsiveness to levodopa medication. Um, in order for us to check that, we do something called 
on-off testing. Have you had that yet? Where you're coming off your medicine and you do this and you do this and all that, yeah. So what we do is we do a, a, a functional examination when you're off your medication. Tapping the fingers, opening, closing the fist. We look at your face, we hear your voice, we watch you walk, we have you getting up in, from the chair. So we score it. Zero means there's nothing bothering you with your symptoms. Four means you can't even do the test because your symptoms are so severe. So we score it. Then we give you your medication. You wait till it kicks in. We repeat the test. And what we're looking for is a 30% improvement in your motor function. And that gives us an indication that not only are you responsive to medications, you will likely be responsive to DBS. We also look for this. We want to see if a patient has one or more of the following. Motor fluctuations, that wearing off, you take your meds, they kick in, and then they drop off. That kind of a roller coaster day. We look for patients who may or may not have prominent tremor. And we also look for patients who might have dyskinesias. Do you know what that word is? Michael J. Fox, the Wigglies? That's dyskinesia, and that's from a lot of medication. It's a side effect of medication. Yes. The tremor? Oh, the question was, what if you're taking levodopa and it doesn't affect your tremor? Well, we know that. We know that there's very few drugs that affect tremor, a particularly levodopa. Many times it doesn't help tremor tremendously. So Dr. Evidente takes that into account when he's looking at the overall test scores. So we always take that into account. That's a good question. They will. You're, in your case, right. So anyway, that's a picture of motor fluctuations. You can see this patient, he was a banker. Look how thorough he is. He took his meds, they kicked in, they worked for about an hour and a half, and then he dropped off, his dyskinesias and his tremors came back. So this was his day. My dad lived like this. We called it daddy's roller coaster day. He would have to plan his whole life around when he took his meds and when they kicked in. So this happened after DBS, completely smooth. No more tremors, no more dyskinesias. It just felt like his medications were working all day long. So let's talk a little bit about essential tremor. Again, you can't just show up, knock, knock, I want that, I want that procedure for my tremor. So essential tremor is actually the most common movement disorder. There are more people suffering from essential tremor than there are from Parkinson's disease, but yet we don't really talk about it much because everybody says, oh, your father had it, your uncle had it, just deal with it. You don't have to deal with it. Central tremor is familial, meaning 50% of the time or more, there's somebody in your family with essential tremor. So this is what we look for with patients with essential tremor. When you've tried two or more medications and they do not work or they're giving you lousy side effects, and in your opinion, your tremor is now affecting your quality of life, it's time to consider DBS. Because remember, DBS was first created for tremor control and it works really well with tremor control. Do you know there are no drugs on the market right now for essential tremor? Every drug that's given is what we call a secondary medication. It's, it's made for something else like nerve pain or cardiac drugs, beta blockers, things like that. And with those meds come a whole host of side effects. So a lot of people that are on primidone complain about being sleepy all the time. And other people, if they have COPD and they're on certain asthma drugs, they can't take some of those medications, the beta blockers. So, you know, there's not a whole lot out there. So we're gonna skip dystonia. I'll give you a, a lesson today, though, on, on uh, medical terminology. Do you know what dystonia is? Have you ever seen anybody walking around with their neck like this? Like that? That's dystonia. Dystonia is involuntary twisting of the muscles. And sometimes patients with Parkinson's have dis, what we call dystonic features, meaning they cramp up their hands, their toes cramp up, their arms could cramp up, and it's very painful. So DBS can help with that. So other considerations when we are selecting patients and offering the procedure to them, 
you have to be in overall general good health because this is elective surgery and we want to make sure that you're going to be healthy enough to undergo the surgery. Here's an example. My dad, who I keep referring to, here I am the nurse and was the nurse in the biggest implanting center in the United States and people say, did your have, dad have DBS? No. Why not? My dad had a very bad heart. He was not a surgical candidate. So that's what I'm talking about. So if you are in the care of a specialist, pulmonologist, cardiologist, et cetera, we always reach out and get clearance from them ahead of time. We say, this patient's gonna undergo deep brain stimulation. We understand you're treating them for X, Y, Z. Will you clear this patient? And are there any things we need to know prior to, for example, if you're on your blood thinner, if you're on Xarelto, you stop it for 72 hours. If you're on Coumadin, you stop it for 10 days. There's all sorts of things we have to do to keep a patient safe following surgery. So we reach out to the specialists and get clearance and instructions from them. We want to look, we want to offer this procedure to patients who are available for DBS programming and follow-up appointments. So if you live in rural New Mexico and you don't have any method of transportation, we're going to think twice about putting any kind of medical device in your body. We look for patients who have family and or community support because following surgery, you can't drive for a couple of weeks. And we like somebody to be with you for the first five days that you're home from the hospital because it is a procedure in your brain and we just want to make sure that you're safe at home. And in those instances where people don't have that kind of support system, Dr. Vidente will admit the patients over to um, the rehab hospital up on Shea Boulevard in Compass where he has privileges and he has personally trained the staff there on how to care for his patients. So the patients then they will drive the patients here to Dr. Evidente's office for programming and follow-up care while they're getting concurrent therapy in the hospital. So right up here on 96th Street and Shea. Right up there. Mm -hmm. It's a half a mile. So what can DBS improve? The cardinal features of movement disorders, tremor, rigidity, and slowness. We can also improve those motor fluctuations I described dyskinesias, the Michael J. Fox wigglies, and dystonic movement, you know, that painful twisting of the muscles. Patients may also see a reduction in medication. And like I said earlier, Dr. Evidente is one of the U.S. Um, most respected doctors who just for some reason, he has the ability to reduce medications on his patients and adjust the stimulation. It's, it's like a balance like this. And he just knows how to do it. So you're in good hands with that. So less likely to improve. We can't fix everything. It's not going to help your balance. It's not going to help your walking. If you have freezing of gait with Parkinson's, you know, when you, people are walking, they stop suddenly. It might not help with that. Trouble with speech or swallowing, depression, anxiety, or cognitive challenges. So we can't promise you that it's going to help. However, anecdotally, we have found that these symptoms may improve if we've seen an improvement in those symptoms when you have your meds. Now, let's talk about anxiety. Let's say somebody with a central tremor, your tremor acts up when you're going to have a cup of coffee at Starbucks, so you get anxious before you go out to a public place. That anxiety is going to go away because we're taking your tremor away. So, or walking, let's say you have Parkinson's and you're walking slowly and stiff and you're not picking up your feet. If we fix the slowness and the stiffness, that kind of walking is going to improve. So, but, okay. I think some of the meds affect my ability to think clearly, focus, stuff like that. Very likely. And for essential tremor, I can tell you, usually most essential tremor patients are stripped off their medications 100%. That's been our experience. Medications causing the cognitive problem? Many times. Tremor. Many times. Many times. So what are your goals and expectations? If you think you're gonna run the Boston Marathon after DBS and you've never done it, that's unrealistic. If a realistic expectation is, I want this tremor to go away so I can put on my earrings, so I can have a cup of coffee. I don't wanna have the stiffness anymore, or the slowness. I wanna be able to get out of bed at night without help. Those are realistic expectations. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I had a patient one time with tremor, a tremor patient, and she said to me, I just want to be able to feed my granddaughter a bottle. 
I can't even feed her a bottle because my tremor is so bad. So what that, those are the kind of things I'm talking about. Yes. Yes, it is. I'm sitting here taking notes. Oh, good. It's a struggle, but I can do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not quite there or there yet. That's up to you and Dr. Evidente. Nobody's pushing this on you. Yes? Um, is there any effect on migraines? No. The question was, is there any effect on migraines? In my experience, no. The only thing we can tell you is we can stop with your tremor, your slowness, and your stiffness. However, I would have a conversation with Dr. Evidente about that. So who is the right patient? A discussion with your physician, which clearly you've had since you're both sitting here. Um, MRI of the brain is sometimes done to screen out other things early on in your diagnosis, but it's not a requirement. You are going to get an MRI prior to surgery. On-off testing we talked about for Parkinson's patients. A neuropsych evaluation. Have either of you undergone that? Neuropsych evaluation. You go in and you're going to be tested for several hours, and we're looking to make sure that you don't have um, any kind of dementia, any kind of severe uh, clinical anxiety or clinical depression, because if you have those types of things, we're not going to do surgery. If you are suffering from depression or anxiety, Dr. Evidente will refer you to somebody to get that in check, taken care of, before we will consider surgery. So we also want to look at cognitive your cognitive domains, your cognitive reserve, because this is an interactive type of treatment. And we need to know when you come in, how was you, how were you over the last couple of days? How was your tremor? How are you feeling? How is your walking? If you have dementia, you can't remember, you're not going to be able to provide that information to your doctor. You also have to have a neurosurgery consultation. Dr. Evidente sends his patients downtown, usually to Dr. Ponce, who was my former boss, who's done more DBS surgeries, I think, than any other surgeon in the United States. CE. So physician consensus. Every couple of weeks, Dr. Evidente, Dr. Ponce, and Dr. Garrett, who's the neuropsychologist, they get together and they discuss all the patients because everybody has to be in agreement that you're, you know, we take an oath, do no harm. We are not going to offer you a treatment that we're going to be putting wires in your brain unless everybody feels that you're a good candidate. That We're very, very careful with that. So they agree on you're a good patient. Where are we going to put those leads in the brain? Because there's a couple different places that Dr. Ponce can put it. What device you're going to have, et cetera, and what battery you've cho chosen. So everybody's on the same page. Everything is, on, is agreed upon and in writing. The battery itself, patient decides. Well, yeah, depending on what choice, let's say you get one of the devices and they only have a rechargeable. Let's say you pick this device, they don't have a rechargeable, that kind of thing. So the reps are going to tell you the bells and whistles. You might, you might have some ideas that you feel are interesting. I thought it was just uh, surgery is okay or not, recharging is okay or not, and that's the basis of it. Or you could get a non-rechargeable. Well, battery yeah it needs a replacement yeah surgery. yeah so you have a little voice in that so let's talk about targets there's two targets for parkinson's one is called the subthalamic nucleus or the stn the other is called the globus pallidus interna and depending on what your symptoms are and what your goals are uh, dr evidente will guide you and choose one or the other i have to tell you if you have bilateral stn meaning two sides of your brain you have to crank it up really high. There has been some complaints of speech difficulties following surgery, meaning you have what's called dysarthria. Dysarthria is a softness and slurriness to your voice. So here's my voice. It's a sunny day in Sun City. I have both sides of my brain done with the STN, and they crank my stimulation up really high because I have, I have very severe symptoms. So my voice might sound like this. It's a sunny day in Sun City. Do you hear the difference? However, with the new technology we all have, we have so many things in our toolbox to avoid this. However, I am obligated to tell you there has been reports of this happening. So 
The GPI, no, it doesn't happen, but programming takes longer because it's a bigger piece of real estate in the brain and it takes longer for the stimulation effects to marinate in the brain tissue. STN, right away. <laughs> Essential tremor. We use an area of the brain called the ventral intermediate, intermediate nucleus of the thalamus. It reduce, re reduces tremor, but it doesn't touch any other symptoms. That's why it's reserved for essential tremor. We don't use it in Parkinson's because Parkinson's, you have other symptoms, and this doesn't help the other symptoms. Again, it may affect speech or balance. There have been reports of that happening, and I'll, I'll get to tell you that, you know, it's a disclaimer. However, there's all sorts of tools we have to avoid these kind of side effects. Uh huh. Yes, very much so. But this is for essential tremor, so you don't have to worry about that. Good. For those of you on uh, Zoom, we're talking about balance. Now, this is here in the brain, like I showed you before, the half a brain. You can see deep down here in this area of the brain, right in here, is where those nuclei are. So you can see. Right here, there's the STN, it's that tiny little white nubbin right there. The GPI is that green area to the left, and the VIM is in that large pink area of the thalamus. VIM, ventral means the side, intermediate in the middle. So those are the areas of the brain. You can see they're all fairly close together. Yeah. So one question is asked of a patient, are we gonna do one side of your brain or two sides of your brain? The majority of the patients get both sides of the brain done, and I'll tell you why. First of all, Parkinson's is a bilateral disease. Even though one side of the body is usually worse than the other, we always wanna do both sides and treat both sides. In, in the setting of essential tremor, sometimes patients come and say, well, it's my right hand that's bothering me the most, I just want that side fixed, and that's fine. However, you know you can put two leads in the brain you don't have to turn both sides on. You can leave one off until the other side's symptoms progress. So to avoid another surgery, sometimes it's beneficial to do two at the same time. But the majority of our patients do go and have both done. Is Parkinson's a disease or a condition? A disease. So what's the agent? It's bacterial? No. What happens is in the brain, there's an area in your brain called the substantia nigra. And in that area of the brain, it produces dopamine. And dopamine is what we call a neurotransmitter. It helps take those messages through the brain for movement. It's like the mailman hand delivering your letter. Well, the mailman goes on strike, or the mailman's a little slower. Those messages or those letters aren't going to get through in a timely manner or correctly. So, therefore, you have tremor, slowness, and stiffness. It's because the neurotransmitter is diminished. The ability to produce dopamine in a Parkinson's patient is diminished. So, and there, there's no way of replacing it, but stimulation can help get those messages through correctly. It's not a disease in the sense of catch it. No, no, it's no, mm -mm. It's no, it's a, yeah. So anyway, something I want you to remember with your brain, your brain is very unique when it comes to the nervous system. The, Le right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. The left side of your brain controls the right side of your body. So if I'm programming you, I go, okay, I'm going to do your left side right now. How does your right hand feel? I don't want you to be confused. Yeah. 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 So you have to decide with Dr. Evidente which device you think is going to suit you. He will give you his opinion based on your symptoms, what he think might be best for you. He programs all three of these devices and he'll help guide you with your decision. Question sure. That's okay. Uh, does Medicare cover this? Yes, sir. 
Uh, if you have Medicare A and B and you have a supplement, you shouldn't have a bill, really. If you're coming from the out of the country in a country that doesn't have insurance and you're a cash pay patient, it could be anywhere from $120,000 to $150,000 wherever you go. Yeah, but that's, 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 uh, I know, but most commercial insurance covers it. The VA covers it. Medicaid covers it. So it's not an issue in this country. All right. I'm sorry. All righty. So surgery. Read the slides and come. Okay. Good. Uh, an informed consumer has a better outcome, no matter what it is, buying a car or having a surgery. Okay, so surgery is scheduled. What happens next? Dr. Ponce does his surgeries downtown at Barrow Neurological Institute, St. Joseph's Hospital Medical Center, or if you are familiar with the Honor Health System and more comfortable, he does the surgeries at Osborne campus. So prior to surgery, you're going to have a planning MRI of the brain. You're going to have labs, x-ray, EKG, see the internal medicine doctor, get pre-op clearances from your specialists. We'll give you specific instructions on what meds to stop before surgery and bathing and showering instructions because they're probably going to give you some antibacterial soap, chin to toes the night before surgery. Just, you don't have to change your bathing habits after you're settled in. No. Thank you very much. Bye. So this is a picture of a planning MRI of the brain. What Dr. Ponce does prior to surgery, he pulls your MRI up, and based on your anatomy, he decides where he's going to put those leads in the brain. Because not everybody's brain is the same. Everybody's different. And you notice those, those leads there, they're not symmetrical because our brains are not symmetrical. So he does this mathematically. He plots his trajectory or how he's going to put that lead in your brain safely and hit the target. No. The question was, do you have to shave your head? No. Dr. Ponce does not shave the head. They clip a little bit of hair just from where the incisions are going to be made on the scalp. So the day of surgery, you're going to get detailed pre-op instructions prior to surgery. Nothing to eat or drink after midnight. Parkinson's patients, please bring your medications to the hospital in the bottles. And Dr. Ponce writes an order. Patient may take meds from home in the event that the hospital doesn't stock your particular medicine, like Ritari, for example. Know where you need to go, ask all the questions you need to prior to surgery. So surgery can be done in two different ways. It can be done with the patient being awake, or it can be done asleep under general anesthesia. Dr. Ponce only does his surgeries asleep under general anesthesia. So DBS surgery is done in two parts. The first part of the surgery is the lead placement. You come into the hospital, the wires are put in your brain, you spend one to two nights in the hospital, and, and you go home. Unless you're one of those patients that doesn't have anybody to help you, so then we send you to rehab. So battery placement, you come into the hospital 10 to 14 days after the wires have been placed, and Dr. Ponce will put the battery in your chest and connect it with that special connector to the battery. You go home that very day. The reason we have to do two surgeries is for reimbursement. Medicare does, and, and commercial insurances don't pay for an inpatient surgery and an outpatient surgery on the same day. So surgery, that's a frame that's put on your head. Your head's all scrubbed up. We're gonna put the frame on your head and the first thing he's gonna do is get a CAT scan in the operating room, take that CAT scan, take that MRI, fuse them together so now we have a 3D picture of your brain and now there's something to measure again so he can tweak that trajectory based on that anatomy that day. Then the arc goes on, they're gonna scrub your head, clip a little hair, and then make a semicircular incision on the skin of the scalp, flap it back, and then with a special drill, it's gonna drill a tiny little burr hole, it's called a burr hole because your skull is bone, and we have to make a little hole there to get the wire through the bone. Just a little one about the size of a dime. 
So then we put the, when the arc's on there, we put the apparatus on here and that helps guide that lead down into the brain. Everything is numeric and it's based on those XYZ coordinates that were created prior to surgery by Dr. Ponce when he was measuring on how he's gonna put that lead in the brain. So that's a picture of my burr holes right there. You can see semicircular incisions because at the end of the surgery, they're gonna put a little plastic cap to hold those leads in place. And then the skin goes back over and he staples. Well, you don't wanna make an incision over an object. So that's why you're gonna have two little smiley faces when you leave. So again, pre-planned target and trajectory, they're loaded on the planning station, the frame is placed, we get an intraoperative CAT scan, fuse it to the MRI, the coordinates are set on the arc, the scalp is cleansed, the hair is clipped at the surgical sites, semicircular incisions, burl holes are done, leads are placed, we verify it in the operating room with another CAT scan before they wake you up to make sure those leads are exactly where he wants them to be. And then the tail of the lead, like I showed you earlier, is tucked under the skin of the scalp and it just sits there nicely until the next surgery is performed in 10 to 14 days. And Dr. Ponce typically uses staples. This is a picture of a CT and an MRI that are fused. And because of, um, our advanced technology that we have now, you can see the detail in the brain. It's amazing what we can see now with advanced radiological technology. This is the CT that's in the operating room. It's called an O-arm. This is what we use. Patient doesn't move. This moves over the patient, click, and moves back like this. It is really a life-saving type of equipment, especially in a trauma center where you don't have to be running a trauma patient back and forth to get a CAT scan. It's right there in the operating room. All right, there we go. That's a picture of the cap. As you can see, the lead is implanted into the brain down here. It comes up through that cap. It sits in a trough and that's the tail that gets tucked under the skin. Two little titanium screws to keep that in place and that lead won't move. And then the skin is flapped over and closed with staples. No, that's plastic. Oh, and Dr. Ponce does something called um, countersinking. So when they drill the hole, the little burr hole, he does it in such a way the cap will sit nice and flat against your skull so you don't have two big bumps there. So anyway, the second surgical procedure, you come in 10 to 14 days later, they're gonna give you a little anesthesia for comfort. And what he's gonna do is make an incision on the side where the battery's gonna go. He'll make a little incision behind the ear, free up those tails, connect them to the connectors and with a special instrument, glide it under the skin of the neck to the chest, do a little incision here, connect everything to the battery, close, staples here, staples here. He'll take these staples out that day. So post-operatively, what to expect? Day after you have the leads placed, you could wake up and your symptoms are better. It's like, ooh, we call that the honeymoon. So when the leads are placed in the brain, brain cells swell up a little bit. And when brain cells swell up, they give off these little electrical charges that could almost mimic the effects of DBS. And that's great if you have a honeymoon. But if you don't, it's okay too. But if you do, keep taking your meds because as the swelling goes down, your symptoms are gonna come back until we turn your battery on. You could have a headache after surgery, right? But up here where these incisions are, it's gonna be numb for a couple of weeks. Most patients complain of pain here and here, and it's because of that frame being on the head. So you're gonna be sent home with some narcotics. Most patients are off any narcotics by the third day, and if they need anything, it's Tylenol. It's not a painful recovery, it's an uncomfortable recovery. You could have some cognitive changes right after surgery. That's why we want somebody with you for about five days because you could have a little short-term memory loss, just slurred speech, word-finding difficulties. It's because of that swelling, but it goes away. And usually by the time you come in for the second surgery, those symptoms have gone away. You could have worsening of your balance or walking anytime you have a procedure in the brain. So just be mindful of that, scatter rugs, small dogs, things like that. 
Swelling around the eyes is very common because you're flat in the OR like this. When you're like that, you could pull up tissue fluid around your eye sockets. It's no big deal. Some people even get a little bruising. It's no big deal, use a little ice. The only thing we get concerned about is if a patient calls up and says, I'm having visual problems. But if you have a little swelling, that's perfectly normal. So what you may experience after we put the battery in, you could have a little neck stiffness. So typically Dr. Ponce's office will give you some neck stretches to do because you don't wanna have the opportunity for scar tissue to build up along the connector because it'll feel a little tight. So just stretch your neck. You could have tenderness at this incision up here. A lot of patients complain that this was the most uncomfortable part of all the surgery. So here's my tip. Get yourself a neck pillow and sleep on it and your incision will float right there. So you won't have any pressure on it, but it will go away, it will feel better. But initially, some people complain that that's very uncomfortable. Also, bruising at your chest incision site. And a lot of ladies, who don't wear a bra after surgery complain of pain. It's because breast tissue is dense and heavy. And if you have this surgery here and you don't support your breast tissue, it may be uncomfortable. So get yourself a good sports bra, a nice cotton sports bra with you know, wide straps here and uh, give yourself a little support so it doesn't pull. Post-op care, most patients after the leads are placed spend one to two nights in the hospital, go home, pain, medication is given to you, ice is your friend, use clean ice packs on your incisions, it's perfectly fine. You can shower three days after surgery. No driving for several weeks, Dr. Evidente will clear you. Use common sense, don't put yourself in a position where you're gonna fall and hit your head. No submerging in pools or hot tubs for six weeks following the battery because it takes six weeks for your skin to close over completely and we don't wanna get any bacteria in the site from a pool because we all know chlorine doesn't kill everything. Also, no push, pull, or lift anything greater than 10 pounds after the battery's been replaced for several weeks because you don't wanna have any undue pressure or stretching on that incision. And do your neck exercises. So reasons patients spend more than one night in the hospital, the number one reason is inability to empty their bladders because as we age, we don't metabolize narcotics or antiseptic agents like we did when we were kids. And sometimes as we age, both men and women have difficulty emptying their bladders. And when you have those two together, boom, we're not gonna send you home until you can completely empty your bladder. So it takes people sometimes a day or so just to get all that out of their system. So we're not gonna send you home until you can. Nausea and vomiting is the number two reason. If you're one of those people that don't do well with anesthesia, tell the anesthesiologist because they can give you medication before they wake you up to avoid that. Confusion, if you wake up and you have that cognitive difficulty that I described earlier, we're not gonna send you home until we can see that you're starting to clear. Pain is the number four reason. Everybody's pain threshold is different. So if your pain isn't being um, addressed, you will keep you another day. And age number five, I put that down there because statistically, if you're over the age of 70, you're more likely to have one of these symptoms. It doesn't mean that if you're over 70, you're gonna spend more than one night, but statistically, it's more possible. So those are incisions. You can see minimal hair is clipped. How nicely that scalp incision healed up. There's a chest incision right up here. It's a little bit pink meaning the body is saying, get these staples out of here. That's not infection, it's just the body's reaction. And you can see this gentleman's scalp 30 days after surgery, you can barely see his incisions. So surgical risks, infection is the number one risk, but um, these are Dr. Ponce's statistics. He will go over them with you in the office, but um, statistically there is minimal risk for this surgery. Lead repositioning, hardware failure, seizure, stroke-like symptoms, bleeds, ischemic stroke. These are all the risks of the surgery, but again, Dr. Ponce's stats are extremely low and he will go over these in detail with you during your consultation with him. A hemorrhagic stroke or an ischemic stroke, or stroke-like symptoms too. That means you wake up and half your body's flaccid, 
It's not, doesn't mean you had a stroke. It means that there's swelling in the brain along that tract. So as soon as the swelling goes down, those symptoms go away. So stimulation side effects. You could have a little weight gain after surgery, particularly if you're a tremor predominant patient, because if you're going like this all the time, you're burning calories. We help your tremor go away and you eat the same amount of ice cream, you're gonna gain a little weight. So mood changes. When you're coming down off of medications, particularly Parkinson's medications, you could have some mood changes. So if that happens to you, please tell Dr. Evidente. What I mean by mood changes is you might be a little melancholy. So please let him know. You could have speech changes like I described earlier. But again, we have all sorts of things in our toolbox with the new technology to avoid that kind of side effect. So when you get your battery placed, you can go home with what we call a patient programmer. That's yours to keep. And um, these are the three that are out there on the market. So what happens is with your patient programmer, you're able to turn your battery on and off. You can put it in surgery mode. You can put it in MRI mode. You can go up and down on your stimulation, but that's all advanced. That's down the road. But there's a lot of things you can do. Like I said earlier, if you have a non-rechargeable battery, you can take your patient programmer and you can check the battery life at home. So programming will start with Dr. Evidente. Shortly after you've had your battery placed in your chest, he likes to get right on it. Um, the first appointment will probably be about an hour and a half because that day they're gonna check all of those little contacts to see which one controls your symptoms the best with the least amount of side effects. And then the objective is to find the setting that helps again with your symptoms and provokes the least amount of side effects. But subsequent visits won't be that long. So medical treatments and tests following DBS surgery, you can never have diathermy, which is deep heat. It's done sometimes for professional athletes. What would happen if you had diathermy, it could heat up the wires that go to your brain and that would be not good. So no diathermy. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. That's something that's a procedure that's done for profound clinical depression. Likely you're not gonna be faced with that because we're not gonna do surgery on you if you have profound clinical depression. But it's a big MRI, you sit there and you have a whole lot of magnet force at your brain and you have metal in your body and it's too much. So you can't have that. Safeguards are needed for electrocautery, that's zapping the bleeders in the operating room. We always caution you and say, if you're having a procedure, just turn your device off. When you wake up, put it back on. You can do it with your patient programmer. Lithotripsy, that's banging those kidney stones. What I mean by a safeguard is instead of the laser or the ultrasound going in an upward manner that could be close to your chest, they'll just point it in a downward manner. So my point here is anytime you go have a procedure anywhere, just tell the doctor or the clinician who is going to perform the procedure that you have a DBS. And many times they'll call Dr. Ponce's office to find out what the guidelines are. MRIs. Full body MRIs are now safe to do following DBS, but we always suggest that you go to a center that has a lot of experience doing DBS MRIs because there are safeguards in place. CT scans, x-rays, PET scans, fluoroscopy, mammographies are all safe. And again, just tell them you have a DBS in your chest and they'll make adjustments. Airport security. You're gonna get a little ID card in your box with your patient programmer. It has your name, and has serial numbers on it. Always carry that with you. Bring your programmer with you to the airport. Do not go through the security gate. Tell the TSA you have a pacemaker, which you do. They'll either send you through the body scanner, which is x-ray and perfectly safe, or they will do a pat down. Don't get wanded because it's rare, but if they hold a wand over your battery for a prolonged period of time, you could get a little jolt and it could shut it off. So tell them you have a pacemaker. You're not lying to the feds. You do have a pacemaker. It's a pacemaker for the brain, but they don't understand what DBS is. So just say you have a pacemaker. They all have safety protocols. Also remember courthouses, sporting events, et cetera, where they have those scanners, tell them you have a pacemaker. See, body scan is safe. Going through that security gate is not because you're gonna set it off. Frequently asked questions, dental work, perfectly safe. You don't need any antibiotic coverage. 
EKGs. If you go to the doctor's office, always bring your programmer with you because sometimes when you run an EKG, it's, it's cloudy. So they're gonna ask you to turn your battery off for 30 seconds, they'll run a strip, and then you turn it back on. Surgical procedures, again, it's always advisable to turn it off, or if you have the kind of device that has surgery mode, you put your device in surgery mode. What if you need emergency resuscitation, you're walking in the mall, you clutch your chest and go down and somebody wants to do CPR or they wanna use the defibrillators, your life is more important. If they break something, we can fix it. So tell whomever, always save your life first. That comes first. And will you experience personality changes after surgery? Like I said, sometimes it's for medication reduction. So if that happens, please tell Dr. Evidente. So the question is, is DBS right for you? Look at the potential risks versus the benefits, have realistic expectations, open discussions with your doctor, your family, and your friends, no questions left unanswered. And again, the keys to successful surgery is appropriate patient selection, that's Dr. Evidente's job, accuracy of the targeting and surgical expertise, that's Dr. Ponce's job, and then patient programming and medication management with an experienced clinician, that's Dr. Evidente. And remember, DBS is an additional therapy for the treatment of movement disorders. It's safe, effective, and reversible. So if there's a cure, we can shut it off or take it out and it won't harm you in any way. It's an elective surgery designed to match your individual symptoms, expectations, preferences, lifestyle. And DBS is not a cure or a treatment of last resort. However, I'm telling you, it's not a cure, but as your symptoms progress over time, the nice thing about DBS is you can make adjustments to the programming as your symptoms change over time. So that's the nice part of it. Any questions? Sure. I'm glad you said that. Um, Medtronic has a device out now called Percept, and Percept has sensing capabilities, meaning that when you come into the office, the doctor can see certain what we call beta waves in your brain. They can see when your dyskinesia spike or when your tremor spikes or when this spikes, and they can make adjustments looking at when you took your medication compared to this and compared to your stimulation, they can make adjustments. So it's an extra level of information that the doctor has available with the Medtronic Percept device. Thank you. The second question is the rechargeable batteries. Are they like a computer slash cell phone battery? You have to let them drain all the way down in order to get full life of battery. So it's about batteries, rechargeable batteries, and do you have to let them drain all the way down? The answer is no. You can top your battery off every day and it's not going to harm it. Perfect. Um, let me see if there's any others. Oh, does DBS help with the fatigue associated with medication failure? Uh, fatigue associated with medication failure. Well, fatigue is sometimes associated with medication in and of itself, whether it works or not. And if we are removing medications or adjusting your medications and lowering the doses, then that type of fatigue definitely can be helped. Does MRI you have to have an MRI in a in a radiology center that has the safety protocol in place. That's what we always counsel, and that's what you must do. If you are, have to have an MRI of a hip, a knee, a toe, whatever, in the future, and you're not sure, and your doctor wants to send you to some local radiology center, more times than not, you're going to show up, and they go, oh, you have a DBS device? We can't do it here. So I always caution you to call Dr. Ponce's office, call Dr. Evidente's office, or call your local device rep and you'll get their information and they can guide you where to go have it safely because there are safety precautions in place. And one of the last questions, how does the doctor minimize brain damage caused from probe insertion? I'm sorry, repeat that? How does the doctor minimize brain damage caused by the probe insertion? 
Well, first of all, we don't call it a probe because that sounds alien-like. So how does the doctor minimize brain damage putting the wires or the leads in the brain? Well, I have to tell you, it's, I hate this phrase, it's overused, like amazing, but minimally invasive. This is a minimally invasive brain procedure. You take that tiny little wire and what happens is brain tissue is much like jello. It kind of goes through the jello, the jello moves away, and then it goes back into place. So it's not slicing, it's not dicing, it's not like you're what we call debulking a brain tumor where you're taking a scalpel and you're scooping out brain tissue. It goes in, the brain tissue moves out of the way, it comes back in like this. So there's no cutting or slicing. The brain is an amazing thing. I'm gonna tell you a story. We had a patient who was in one of our trials, an Alzheimer's trial, believe it or not, for DBS that is still going on. He died and he donated his brain to science. So he came into Barrow. I get a call one day from the morgue. Can you come downstairs? We need you to check and turn off a DBS device before they can proceed with the autopsy. Okay, fine. I go down there. I knew this patient. So I checked everything. Well, fast forward a couple of weeks, we're at a meeting and the doctor who did the autopsy said, it was amazing. He took the device out of the brain. He took the wire out. He took everything out before he started the autopsy. When he sliced through that brain tissue, you know, when you do an autopsy, you slice little tiny slices of brain, put them on a slide and look at it under a microscope. He said, there was no evidence that a wire was in that brain. So even in death, removing the wire, the brain tissue just goes right back to where it was. So I hope that answers your question. I have one final question. Your slide team has stated that infection is one of the number one causes, but bleeds had a higher percentage. How would that work? Okay, let me explain bleeds to you and what that percentage means. Bleeds, there are two, when we're talking about massive bleeds, the answer is no, that doesn't happen with DBS. However, following surgery, sometimes you have what we call a subdural hematoma. So I want you to picture my hand. I'm gonna hit it with a hammer and it's gonna become purple and blue. That's blood, right? Sometimes putting those leads in, putting the caps on, you could have what's called the subdural hematoma, which is a brain bleed up here. So here's the, here's the scalp, here's the skull, and here is a protective coating called the dura. It's like a skin over the brain. And below that is the brain. So subdural means between this layer of skin and the brain, there's a collection of blood. And sometimes it can cause some symptoms. It could cause um, slurred speech. It could cause memory difficulties. It could cause visual difficulties. So in those cases, we tell you, come to the emergency room, we'll evaluate you. The other half, of those in that statistic that I had on that slide was after a patient is ready to leave the recovery room, Dr. Ponce always gets a CAT scan just to check before he sends the patient upstairs. Sometimes, 50% of the time, they will find a little bit of these subdural hematomas on a CAT scan, yet the patient has no symptoms whatsoever. So that has to be included in the statistics. Um, those two strokes that were on there, those ischemic sh strokes, Ischemic strokes are what we call dry strokes versus a hemorrhagic stroke where you have a massive brain bleed. Ischemic stroke means the blood didn't flow to a certain area of the brain completely, so they had a little bit of tissue die off and you have stroke symptoms. Though There were two patients, that's it out of 1,200, two patients. Both went to neuro rehab, both recovered 100%. Of those 1,200 patients, I can tell you there is one patient that still has some residual weakness on one side of his body from that bleed he had in his brain. But we have had no massive brain bleeds and no deaths associated with DBS. And I think that wraps it up, folks. So thank you for your time today. I hope this was helpful. Again, an informed consumer is your has a better outcome, so please ask questions to Dr. Evidente and Dr. Ponce, and I thank you for your time today. And in a minute, the um, reps are going to come and talk to you about their devices. So thank you very much, and have a wonderful day.